Good evening. This is Mae Russell. The title of this one-hour broadcast is World Watchers. It's program some number 766, and it's August the 11th, 1986. For people who are not familiar with this fact, you may order the bibliography of sheets that accompany each broadcast, send a self-addressed stamped envelope to May Brussel, P.O. Box 22511, Carmel 93922, and I'll give you the source of information from the articles that I use for this hour or any other one, World Watchers, that you have heard. I spoke in the last several weeks about Chief Justice Warren Berger of the Supreme Court resigning at this time to take over the celebration of the Constitution that will be similar, I guess, to the Statue of Liberty celebration, only there will be changes in the Constitution this time, probably uh, uh, a lot that we don't know. One that they're working on is that 22nd Amendment to clear the way for Reagan to be president forever if he wants to. And I'm sure they'll throw in then the changing of the not allowing the foreign born to be president. And I keep reiterating this because of the importance of making way for Henry Kissinger. Now, this past week, Representative Guy Vanderjack, pardon me, <clears throat> of JAGT of Michigan, asked that the 22nd Amendment be repealed, making clear the way for Ronald Reagan to have a third term. And Vander Jack is chairman of the National Republican Congressional Committee. He wants Americans to be allowed to decide how long their president should serve. He said the 22nd Amendment is an insult to American voters who are wise and informed. He has asked House Judiciary Committee Chairman Peter Rodino of New Jersey to promptly initiate action on that bill. And the Beverly Hills Courier, home base of Ronald and Nancy, and most of their kitchen cabinet and friends, had an editorial by March Schwartz, the editor. This is August the 8th, 1986, on the White House scenario of changing the Constitution and having Ronald Reagan president again. And he goes over the weaknesses of the Republicans and the Democrats and thinks that there's a very positive thing in having Ronald Reagan president. Mr. Schwartz said we were in Geneva as part of the presidential entourage, during the first Reagan-Gorbachev summit, we saw how much Gorbachev admired the U.S. president. Reagan standing with other world leaders is stronger than ever, and meeting after meeting, he added to his stature. He doesn't talk about the world court, you know, that decided that Reagan was out of bounds with his foreign policy in Nicaragua. He refers to his winning personality, his stage presence, his innate honesty. That's why he stamps everything top secret his indomitable spirit, and his determination to stick to his guns. He has served the country well, and he goes into his wonderful domestic programs and added to the asset of Ronald Reagan is Nancy Reagan, who's helped her husband so much. The Courier believes Reagan would be a sure winner and that his continued occupancy of the White House would serve America and the rest of the world to great advantage. Uh, this will snowball and keep building up. Now, along with Reagan's uh, image running mate, there was an article in the Washington Post, July 26. Bush departs on Mideast image building trip. Uh, they're very open about it. There are not many secrets. And it shows George Bush sitting with the president uh, with empty plates. They're supposed to be having lunch at the White House. Bush is looking to the left. Reagan is looking at him. A definitely staged picture. And then two days later, you probably all saw it. There's George Bush with a yarmulke kissing the Wailing Wall in Israel. So they announce, you know, two days before he's kissing the wall, that it's an image building trip. And then over the wire services goes Bush with his two hands up, holding his cheek to the wall. I referred to that picture before, which is disgusting. But the Washington Post just throws it off as image building to get the Jewish vote. And, of course, March Schwartz in Beverly Hills is a Jew and I'm sure running, putting Reagan in another term, he loves to see George Bush kiss the Wailing Wall. Alexander Haig had a, some comments in the newspaper this week that are typical Haig. Haig says that Star Wars should have been secret. President Reagan should have kept his Star Wars space missile system plans a secret rather than going public in 1983. That date that I keep referring to was March the third, March the 23rd, 1983, 
where he is going to shift the space and NASA and the heavens to a battlefield and take the civilian uh, milieu around it away and make way for Star Wars. Haig said the Strategic Defense Initiative, at st- dubbed the Star Wars, is needed to present, prevent the Soviet Union from establishing a military monopoly in space. I wish whomever wrote that speech had asked him to give it on the secure line, Secretary of Defense Weinberger to Weinberger, rather than in the headlines of this country, Haig said. Now, Haig was behind the secrecy of the White House tapes of Richard Nixon and became chief of staff at that time and covered up the entire uh, military operation that was behind the Watergate intentions. And he's absolutely right they should have kept it secret because once that out was out in the open, uh, it meant a lot of explaining and budget turning around, whereas we have budgets for other secret weapons that uh, we don't know about. And he feels it should have been kept secret because of all the controversy that's followed. Now, Alexander Haig's uh, mentor, Fritz Kramer, shares space in offices in Washington, D.C. with Daniel Graham of High Frontier. And Haig is very much part of the Star Wars operation, and he's sorry that we were ever told about it. Uh, one reason he's sorry probably is because of the news coverage that details the cost. July 23rd, there was an article, Your Share of Star Wars is $570 every year in extra taxes. The cost for the next few years of Star Wars is $770 billion, but that's just the beginning. We don't have the cost overrun. $770 billion for Star Wars, and each American citizen for what you earn next year and every year will be paying $570 a year in your taxes to Star Wars so you really can figure it is yours and uh, everybody who pays taxes pays a share, $570 of it will go to Star Wars. Now, the time that Star Wars was announced in March of 83, Edward Teller was in the White House writing the speech for the president. He was right by his side. And shortly afterwards, a corporation that uh, which he's on the board and was given stock on the board, the stock went way up. It was called Helionetics. And I did a few broadcasts on Helionetics because they were involved with Edwin Meese and his wife Ursula Meese and surfaced at the time of the hearings on Edwin Meese. Just this past week, Helionetics went bankrupt. Uh, rather than be charged by the Security Exchange Commission or the foreknowledge of what was happening, they declared bankruptcy. And the Los Angeles Times had an article July 29th last week, and it shows a picture of some of the board members of Helionetics Retired Admiral Thomas Hayward, who now works at Lytton Industry, hydrogen bomb developer Edward Teller, retired Air Force General David C. Jones, and former U.S. Treasury Secretary William E. Simon. Simon was in charge of the Olympic Games at the time that this uh, scandal broke. The president had the speech on Star Wars, and then the stock went way, way up to $30 a share from $6 up to 30 and each one of them would have made a lot of money. They probably did make it, but if the contracts went through, and because of the scandals, that is the reason that Helionetics is closing now. The LA Times said when the company won military contracts to develop blue-green laser communication systems for the Navy, critics complained that the company was profiting from its board members, Pentagon Connections. Further, Edward Teller, who owns nearly 34000 Helionetic Shares was criticized for his role in advocating a space-based laser defense system because he could potentially profit from the Helionetics laser system. So Helionetics this past week went bankrupt, but some very big heavyweights were on the board, and whether they made a profit quickly from that or had to give it back or were investigated, it was all hushed up, and uh, it's, for all purposes, it's shelved or they'll change their name but they made a quick fix by quickly having the stock raise as soon as the president had made the speech. And Edward Teller, also on the board of Western Goals with the late Larry McDonald, and all of this was happening just before Larry McDonald's death, these scandals of the Star Wars funds and the people who would profit from it and making the decisions about it in the Pentagon uh, all came together. And uh, as I say, right now, Helion Eddings, for all purposes, is folded. Also, the Helionetics director, a man named Bernard Katz, was involved in a company 
uh, several companies that were under investigation from the Security Exchange Commission, and one of them was a firm called Zonix, Z-O-N-I-C-S, and that involved X-ray equipment. And Zonix was the connection, and I'll, I can refresh your memory. I believe I did broadcast on the links of that to Edwin Meese and Dr. Brian, a close friend of Meese, an associate uh, for many, many years, and there were scandals involving the former director of Helianetics who had to step down as director of his own company because of stockhold investigations of Mr. Katz. Now, I co-partnered with Alexander Haig, um, who wants this uh, important job of president, who's saying we should have concealed Star Wars. His co-friend and co-worker, Henry Kissinger, had another, an article this week or an interview, which is typical of the Hague kissinger mentality. Kissinger warns Israel probe may harm security. Israel is racked with investigations into the Pollard, James Angleton, Rafi Tan spy scandal, the fact that Israel has been sending arms to Iran, to Khomeini, the sh- shooting of two PLO uh, uh, they took off a bus and killed. They said that they were originally shot with four others, and two men were killed separately by the chief of the Israeli equivalent of the FBI. Now, Kissinger warns them, don't investigate that the probe may harm your security. This is the advice from Daddy Kissinger, who's covered up so many things in this country. As the Israeli police launched their investigation into the killing of two Palestinian hijackers, the former U.S. Secretary of State Henry Kissinger warned that the probe could damage Israeli security services. Imagine that two PLO were killed and Israeli secret service or intelligence services would be in jeopardy because of that act. The Tel Aviv newspaper reported that Mr. Kissinger gave advice in a message to Foreign Minister and Deputy, Deputy Prime Minister Yatsak Shamir. In a letter, he reported a 1970s Senate probe of the Central Intelligence Agency, that was the Frank Church Committee and the Senate Watergate Committee, that exposed some of its operational techniques and controversial covert actions. Those were the activities of Alexander Haig and Henry Kissinger. He advised that Israel should proceed cautiously and secretly in any investigation and into the general security services of the Shin Bet, which they say is like the FBI. And the shit bed has been threatening to collapse because of the cover-up of the murder of two PLO that were on the bus. So Henry Kissinger is spreading his world influence. He knows how to cover up in this country. Goodness knows, and he spreads it over there. Alexander Haig says, we shouldn't have told you about Star Wars. And Kissinger tells the Israeli intelligence, don't probe. I got in trouble in the 70s. Keep it secret. Speaking of secret, and it isn't a secret anymore, and I did several broadcasts on it, there was the expose of breaking into the offices of Shearson American Express in Philadelphia. And that is a client of Kissinger Associates, and one of the chief officers of that uh, particular branch of Shearson American Express moved and fled to Brazil and worked with the San Paulo uh, connections to the Mengele, I call them the Mengele Nazi, uh, Kissinger intrigue down in San Paulo, Brazil, the links of the Philadelphia Sherson American Express to South America in the area that I've done many broadcasts on. This week, the New York Times had a story, pardon me, June 26, but I just uh, pulled it out to share with you this week. The United States accuses Sherson of money laundering. And this is Philadelphia, June 26, New York Times. Shearson Lehman Brothers and the former manager of the Philadelphia office were indicted on charges of laundering at least, which could go up to $60 million, but it's at least $1.2 million for organized crime gambling syndicate. And that's what Kissinger and Haig are about, is putting in the crime syndicates and drug dealers when they affect a coups and the narcotics keep flowing in. The indictment was announced by the federal and city prosecutors and charged the former manager and six other Philadelphia men, including the son-in-law of former mayor Frank Rizzo, with conspiracy and operating illegal sports gambling enterprise. It was the first indictment of a brokerage house on charges of failing to report cash transactions. The brokerage house, as I say, is a client of Kissinger Associates. Uh, Kissinger Associates was actually... uh, Uh, very influential in contacting countries. He takes on countries 
and organizations that pay 250 to 500,000 a year for in quotes advice but most of it always eventually and probably uh, gets exposed as related to assassinations to drug dealing and all kinds of hanky panky including uh, links to fascism around the world the interesting thing that they tried to do at the Shearson American Express was instead of banking $10,000, which was the amount that had to be declared, uh, 10000 cash, be, when you got that kind of a deposit, had to be declared over that amount, they broke their deposits into 9999 But that's what uh, sophisticated corporate lawyers will do for you. There's a possible $16.5 million fine. Shearman, uh, Shearson and Mr. Cantley, the manager, were both indicted on two counts of conspiracy, 30 counts of failure to file currency transactions. Mr. Cantley was charged with aiding and betting illegal gambling business. He could be sentenced to 198 years. I'll bet you he gets probation. They say right away the penalty is high, and then you know all of a sudden they're let off. There's a 69-page indictment, but as I say, these connections go back uh, down to South America and I'll do more on that if you want me to and see if I've done that for you before. I'm not sure of the uh, Brazilian connections to Shearson and uh, this particular office and Henry Kissinger. Now, San Francisco Chronicle had an article this week that Alexander Haig wants to run for president. We know that. He mentioned that several weeks ago. There's nothing new. But what was new in the article, and I've never seen it in print before, it's been in a few books, was that they gave credit to Haig's kiss, his mentor, Fritz Kramer. None other than Fritz Kramer surfaced in the news this this past week in the San Francisco Chronicle, and they credited him being behind the career of Henry Kissinger and then their relationship with Mr. Califano, who also is in the Defense Department, the CIA, the Defense Intelligence Agency, and the links to Alexander Haig. So Kramer is surfacing. He's only been seen in a few books, mentioned always by Henry Kissinger as being his mentor, but in terms of running for president, Haig is now referring to Henry K to Fritz Kramer as his mentor. And what I want to know is how expensive is a fingerprint? Get a fingerprint in public in Peter Rodino's congressional committee to put his thumb and fingers down and see if they are different or the same as Adolf Hitler's Fritz Kramer. That should be easy to do. There's an article, another article in the Chronicle, different than that one, a different day. Haig thinks he'll run for president. He probably will run for president in 1988. He says, some people think I'm too hawkish. And he was speaking at the Bohemian Grove that I referred to last week on the broadcast. And he said he's really a moderate and that he resigned from President Reagan's cabinet under pressure. In 1982, I was under constant attack. What he was attacked for was that he was favoring the P2 and Licio Jelly and the Argentine junta dictatorship with their death squads over Great Britain in the Falklands War, and his conversations on the airplane were intercepted when Ronald Reagan was in Barbados, his favoring Argentina over Great Britain in that case, and he also gave the green light to Israel for the invasion of Lebanon, the massacre of women and children, he wasn't fired because he was a hawk or he was a liberal. I mean, what I'm telling you about him is, indicates what kind of a hawk he is. And he said he, he made some mistakes. I'm not a marionette. And he said that reporters always like to refer to the time when Reagan was shot. And he said, I am in control here in the White House when John Hinckley and somebody else, not John Hinckley alone, took shots at Ronald Reagan. So he wants to run for president. He's surfacing the Fritz Kramer, the plans officer of the Pentagon, an officer over him in South Korean War, Vietnam, and uh, actually was in Washington, the White House through those periods. But uh, he did serve, I believe, sometime in Vietnam. So Haig has uh, announced not only that he wants to be president, and I doubt if he would win if Ronald Reagan ran for a third term, but he's pulling out Kramer, which is very interesting. There was a death this past week that, of course, you understand is purely coincidental. Sir Moses I. Finley, F-I-N-L-E-Y, age 64, from Cambridge, England. 
noted scholar at Cambridge University, wrote books that were uh, accessible to the general public. He died June 23rd. He was born in New York. He was educated at Syracuse and Columbia University. In 1952, he was teaching at Rutgers when he and other faculty members were called before the U.S. Senate to a uh, subcommittee on internal security. They testified they were not communists. These are the Senator Joe McCarthy hearings. But he refused to say whether they had ever been in the past. When they refused to obey the Rutgers Board of Trustees demand that they testify, they were all removed from the payroll. He later went on to be a lecturer and teacher at Cambridge. He described his political activities there and in the United States. While at Syracuse to receive an honorary degree in 1982, he boycotted the commencement address by then Secretary of State Alexander Haig because he said his presence would su suggest support for Haig's foreign policy, so he would not be there. The same time that Haig announces on July 16th that he's going to run for president or wants to run for president, July 16th there's an announcement that Sir Moses Finley, who obviously is an educated person, a teacher, and an anti-Haig person, uh, is dead in England. They didn't give the cause at age 64. Henry Kissinger, the co-partner of Kramer and Haig, has a syndicated column every week in the newspaper. And last week, he talked to, the title is called Grand Compromise. The L.A. Times has a large issue of it, the San Francisco Chronicle, and it goes all over the world, the syndicated column, to keep Henry Kissinger in your eyes at all times. And he talks about two important essential principles that the president must have if he visits Moscow. One is the deployment of the strategic defense. You can't separate it from any other kind of defense. And the important thing is strategic defense. And SDI, again, is the important uh, aspect of former Defense Intelligence Agency Chief Daniel Graham, who, again, shares offices with Fritz Kramer, the mentor of Haig and Kissinger. So these boys keep pushing the strategic defense initiative. Now, the man who brought uh, Fritz Kramer to the United States. All of these men are from Germany, and they came to the United States during the war, or just before. Fritz Kramer came before America had entered the war, but he he was brought in by Peter Drucker. I haven't updated much on Peter Drucker for you. Peter Drucker is Clark Professor of Political Science at Claremont School in California. It's in Los Angeles, um, the east part of Los Angeles, He's been there for quite a few years. If you look on the racks of video cassettes now in various stores, you see Peter Drucker's uh, video cassettes, tape cassettes, books. He's become he's always been visible, but he's becoming more and more visible. And this week, with the subject of Kramer and Kissinger and Alexander Haig's names in the news, it's interesting that Wall Street Journal, August the first, has an article, and they run continuous articles by Peter Drucker on how to manage the boss. That's a good title because uh, he knows how to do that and how to keep the boss aware. His name is in the news and in the Wall Street Journal, and it tells you how to handle and iron out reports of consensus and so forth, working with Eisenhower or President Reagan. And how, the important thing is that I see his, his cassettes in the bookstores, radio shops, and he's becoming very visible. Now, there's another man who has not been so visible because of news blackouts, who is linked to Alexander Haig when Haig worked at United Technology. And I'll, I'm going to cite this very short article in two different places this evening. The title of the article is Probe of Mystery Figure Widens. It was in the Washington Times July 16th, and it has to do with Francesco Pazienza, and I've talked about him at great length, but not enough, Pazienza was at Alexander Haig's office. Remember, I cited the date. It was a day after John Lennon was murdered with Michael Ledeen. Uh, he has been in a prison or a jail in New York City since, over the past year, and he went back to Italy. Now he's been sent back to Italy, but he was held and sequestered, particularly while the trial of Aja was going on. Aja uh, was charged with shooting Pope John Paul II, and Aja was going to implicate the Bulgarians and the KGB. And he also talked about Francesco Pazienza, 
trying to squeeze a Russian story out of it that didn't exist, that he was a pressure point in the prison with Ali Mehmet Aja, trying to turn this into an Eastern conspiracy instead of the West, uh, and coming from the CIA. The article, the, the short article says, the United States has loosened the terms of extradition of former Italian secret agent Francesco Pazienza, allowing him to tra- stand trial on extortion. Charges, judicial sources said yesterday, Pazienza, 40 years old, a former assistant to the Director General of the Italian Intelligence Service, whose name has been linked with a series of Italian crimes and political mysteries, was extradited from a New York prison June the 19th. He secretly, quietly left New York City. Now, Michele Sindona, his partner, was given cyanide and murdered in the Italian jail just recently, and Ali, uh, Mehmet Ali Jah has tuberculosis, so doesn't have too long to live if the diagnosis is correct. Their partner, Roberta Calvi, was murdered in London, and he's been sent to Italy on a minor charge of approximately a $20,000 swindle when he's involved with murder, death squads, and multinational violence and swindles. He was sequestered out of New York June the 19th. Now, this is the interesting part of this story. The original terms of his extradition, this is America making the original terms, allowed the authorities to investigate only his connection to the 1982 collapse of Banco Ambrosiano, only the money connections. Italy's, it was Italy's largest private banking failure. Judicial sources said that the, time, the terms do not allow magistrates to question Pazienza about the illegal P2 Masonic Lodge, which involved the military dictatorship in Argentina and Monte Carlo and in Europe and many other places, United States, or the 1980 bombing that killed 85 people at Bologna Railway Station, which he orchestrated with Lizio Gelli, and his alleged illegal activities by the Italian Secret Services, which the Washington Times, the Reverend Moon Paper, very nicely doesn't include the Italian Secret Services using him to see Aja to swing a Cold Hot War Russian KGB link to the assassination of the Pope. And it was to divert from Lizio Gelli, who was at Ronald Reagan's inauguration, it was to divert, divert from the relationship of Pazienza to Aja or Michael Ledeen and Claire Sterling and Paul Hensa, all of the CIA, all of them creating the fabric of terrorism and blaming the Russians for something they didn't even think about. So Pazienza is in Europe, but the terms are that they don't go into the Bologna bombing. If you go to the Bologna bombing and you have a mass murderer being charged in Italy on the Bologna bombing, then you have the mass murderer directly linked to Alexander Hagen, Ronald Reagan, so you have to keep that part out of it so he can go over there if he doesn't mess around with that. Now, in the newspaper this morning in the San Francisco Chronicle, this is August the 11th, 1986, and many of you have probably seen it by now, Double Defector levels new charges at the CIA. Vitaly Vitaly Yurchenko, the Soviet defector who made a dramatic return to Russia in November of '85 told a Moscow newspaper that the CIA tried to make him implicate the Soviet Union in the 1981 attempt to assassinate Pope John Paul II. And that's to tie him in with Ledeen, hence, uh, uh, you know, uh, Sterling, Pazienza script. In Saturday's edition of Pravda, Yurchenko said the CIA tried to get him to publicly expose Soviet plans for subverting Central America. When he asked for proof of this, Yurchenko said he was told that materials and documents would be brought to him and that he would testify to their authenticity. He said that Tom Fountain, identified in the article as a deputy CIA director, told him in quotes, our press will do what it can so people believe you. It has had comparable experience. And the point about the press is, do you remember the NBC one-hour white paper by Marvin Kalb, whose brother Bernard Kalb runs the State Department news for NBC, going in for one hour into the KGB connections that were created 
by Alexander Haig of NATO, formerly of NATO, Francesco Pazienza, Claire Sterling, Michael Ledeen, and Paul Henza. We used one of our three major news media networks, the NBC, to have a white paper to make the KGB connections and what they were telling him our press has had experience. And you better believe they've had experience on that. Our press has. And Yurchenko was told to say that the KGB was involved. I'll take a one-minute break here and then go back and finish this article, and there'll be much more about that in the news, I'm sure, and continue along those lines with dirty tricks that tie into people who want to be president of the United States or be reelected as president but are caught in these dirty dealings of drug money, murders, assassinations, bank collapses, and so forth. They go right up to the highest office of the White House at the present time. This is May Brussel. This is the second half of broadcast number 766. Continuing on that article, which is titled in the San Francisco Chronicle, Double Defector Levels New Charges at CIA, they said that the federal executive director, which lists CIA personnel, doesn't have a showing of any one named Fountain, but the agency has a policy of refusing to comment. And, of course, when he walks up and he says, I'm Mr. Fountain, he could be uh, Howard Hunter, anybody else. Mr. Yurchenko knew the top people in the CIA, but anyone who comes to him who gives a certain name, I'm sure he's not going to look it up or question the name. Yurchenko said that CIA Director William Casey, who is a Knight of Malta and part of this Vatican entourage, told him that it was necessary to convince the world that all anti-American activities in Latin America are directed by Moscow. Now, Ronald Reagan gave Henry Kissinger the ch in charge, put him in charge of all the Central American policy. And in order to wipe out those countries and make them safe for dictatorships such as Mr. Pinochet and his kind, or Mr. Z of Pakistan, which Kissinger put, he nicely put them into power, or because of the murder of John Kennedy, we have Ronald Reagan in power, the, the two Kennedy brothers. Uh, they wanted the Central American policy to appear all Russian so we can send in our troops. Yurchenko said the CIA was preparing him to testify in Rome that the Secret Service police, the KGB, worked with the Bulgarians in the plot to kill the Pope. Yurchenko was to play the part of someone named Malenkov. Now, if he's to be Malenkov, uh, <laughs> Mr. Tom Fountain could have been somebody else. He was supposedly to have met with Sergei Antonov, the Bulgarian airline official who was accused of conspiring with Mehmet Ali Aja. Malenkov would testify that he gave Aja three million West German marks for the job. In presenting me as a ranking KGB officer, the Americans hoped to give special weight to the, my testimony and to exert a decisive influence over the course in the Rome trial. This is totally disgusting. Yurchenko, who said that he was an embassy security officer, disappeared from the Soviet embassy in Rome in August of 85. He lived in Rome. He disappeared in August 85. When he appeared in the Soviet embassy in Washington in November, it was said, he said he was kidnapped and coerced by the CIA. At a subsequent press conference in Moscow, he said he escaped from his keepers by walking from a Georgetown restaurant. Last March, he was seen again in the Soviet Union, and Saturday's interview they called the CIA's Kitchen of Falsehoods is the first official public word from him since the November press conference. He called it the CIA's Kitchen, based, as supposed, on the cabinet kitchen cabinet that put Ronald Reagan in. And as I say, the press are very good at covering this. George Seldes wrote a book on the American press. He's a great researcher. He's about 94 now. He's written... Uh, a long series of books and used to publish, in fact, and in his book, 1,000 Americans, Enemies of America, he described the press in 1947 after the war. He said, the first fact is that while documentation is available, it has not been presented to the public because the press and other avenues of communication are in the hands of a 1,000 Americans. That was 1947. There are fewer of them now. The facts speak for themselves, all right. Now, he is talking about the fact that information on Pazienza and these cover-ups was available for people to see if you wanted to see it. 
Uh, we've done a, I've done a lot of broadcasts on it, and David Emery uh, in Los Aldos on KFJC has done a tremendous amount of work on this terrible scandal and tried to expose it. He did a five-part series, three hours each, called The Mediterranean Merry-Go-Round, and where he describes the Pazienza links to the Vatican and to the White House and to Los Angeles and South America and the death squads and so forth, a tremendous job of research. And I'll give you the address of where you can order these tapes. It's very important. But the information is out there if you want to read it. Just like last week, I cited uh, the fact that Mein Kampf was available and nobody would read it. It was there for you to see. The Pazienza story is out. And George Seldy said, that the facts speak for themselves. They're frequently seen in the congressional record, in three or four liberal weeklies, and through the pages of books which have a sale of 2,000 co uh, copies. Uh, particularly in these times is one of those uh, American weeklies or semi-weeklies that had uh, a lot of articles on the story of Aja and the covering up of the relationship to American intelligence. They carried that through the whole trial and through this whole scandal. Seldy said, as late as a decade ago, he's talking about 1937, the Scripps Howard newspapers were a powerful chain in America and they served the public well instead of corporate interests. Then the Federal Trade Commission published their, find, their findings and these newspapers did likewise. The findings were simple. They said that the light and power industry used a fund of between 25 million and 30 million in 1937 to 1947 to bribe and corrupt and fund editors and owners and publishers of newspapers around the country. And all of this is indexed and available so that the news you get is, is quieted by millions of dollars. And imagine 20 or 30 million in those days, what it would be now to stop stories from coming out. Now this past week, the Pope was down just a week ago down in Columbia and there was a story, of course, you all read in the newspaper, Pope urges the Colombian poor to reject violence. Well, I suppose there's nothing that I hate worse than uh, hypocrisy. And if you want to order those tapes of David Emery and Nip Tuck, I'll give you the address. It's Davcore, D-A-V-K-O-R-E Company, 1300-D, Space Park Way, Mountain View, California, 94043. Write and ask for uh, their series on Who Shot the Pope. They did a long section on that. These are 90-minute tapes on fascism in the Vatican, the P2 Lodge and the Vatican banking scandals, the P2 Lodge, the more, the Stebaum, which is the link of the narcotics, and uh, connections to Hollywood and Reagan and Frank Sinatra, and the international drugs, and that also goes down to San Paulo, Brazil, through Tomasa Buceta and the Western Intelligence Connections. These are a marvelous series. There's 15 hours on what they call the Mediterranean merry-go-round. And for the Pope to tell the poor in Colombia to give up violence, when everything in these uh, hours is documented, the 15 hours of continuous linkage of the Vatican, the Pope, it's about the Vatican, not all Catholics, but the Vatican. There are links to Adolf Hitler. There are links to Mr. Franco in Spain, to Mussolini, to the rat line that let the top Nazis leave Europe after World War II, to dope and international narcotics, to death squads that are in Central America and South America, and links to the World Anti-Communist League, to gun running, and every kind of crime that has been brought upon mankind starting with tremendous amount of funding from Italy, first the Vatican, and then with Paul Marcinkas and Michele Sindoni and Lizio Gelli, Francesco Pazienza, and that Roberta Calvi. And this network going to America, and as I say, Gelli was at Reagan's inauguration. Sindone allegedly gave Richard Nixon a million dollars. Uh, the denial that he didn't take it, it doesn't even stand because the first thing that happened when the Watergate defendants were arrested was to get a shredding machine and destroy all the books and finances at the committee to reelect the president. So how can you say they didn't uh, exist? The facts didn't exist about Sendona and the Vatican funding Richard Nixon and Spiro Agnew, particularly Agnew. Now, again, the Pope was attacking Nicaragua for expelling a bishop, and the government says down there that they're involved in intelligence 
and the Vatican has been screaming about closing La Prensa, the newspaper in Nicaragua, that there's no freedom of the press. And the Sandinistas say that La Prensa could be used and was used by the Central Intelligence Agency, that the CIA funded a newspaper such as El Mercurio in Chile that was behind the overthrow of Allende, and that newspapers can be CIA fronts, and the Pope is screaming about the bishop leaving and the press closing when they are conduits of also the Knights of Malta, the policies made by Haig and William Buckley and Mr. Frank Shakespeare and Vernon Walters and a series of government officials who are representing the Vatican and the Vatican funding the Contras. So the idea that the Pope tells the people in Colombia avoid violence, the poor, is just absolutely horrendous. Now, I haven't heard anything about the Vatican screaming or Washington screaming about the death of newspaper people in Mexico. The La Prensa is closed. Nobody was murdered. There's an article in the LA Times this past week, uh, July 31st. Grim stories for Mexico journalists, 27 slain in 15 years and no convictions. Now, if you read up and added up the American journalists that have been killed in the last 10 years or 15 years, I think we'd find just as many such as Dorothy Kilgall and Jessica Savage, and I could go on and on of newspaper people and list them. I have lists of them who've been murdered for certain articles they wrote, such as Jessica Savage doing a movie and documentary on the murder of Roberta Calvi in London. In Mexico last week, just two liberal writers uh, were murdered in a town called Matamoros. They were blown up. Ernesto Flores Torrijos, publisher of El Popular, and Norma Moreno Figuera, also gunned down, 24 years of age, gunned down in Mexico. Journalists exposing some of their the links of corruption in Mexico that also touch the United States. So the idea that you close an office of a newspaper isn't an act of violence. It's a matter of self-defense, of surviving. But when the newspaper people are diligent in their work, they're gunned down like dogs at a hunting feast. And then the wall of silence takes over. The London Observer, May the 4th, had an article nearing the end of the Calvi Trail. And this is looking for money of Roberta Calvi, who was the head of the Banco Ambrosiano in Italy, in Milan. Calvi went to England. That's where he was hung. And several people from Ireland and Britain have been following the money and the creditors and the banks where the money, disappearing money, went. And this money was tied to the Vatican, and they made a settlement for $250 million of the missing money. And this article from the London Observer has to do with Michele Sindona, the Machiavellian Sicilian lawyer, recently murdered, and the Institute pour la Prayer de Religion, it's IOR, it's for religion, the money for the religion, the Vatican's bank, and Lizio Jelly, who's now in Uruguay, living down there in Uruguay. And as I mentioned last week, Ecuador is filled with the Sikhs and the far right wing assassins that are flooding into Ecuador. And San Paulo, Brazil, continues with its strong fascist connections. The observer cites the um, P2 Masonic Lodge that was headed by Umberto Ortolani, now a fugitive from Italy who's living in San Paulo, Brazil. That's the nest of Mr. Romeo Tumo, the police chief who said that Joseph Mengele was in that coffin. He wasn't there, and uh, there are many reasons to not believe that was Mengele, but the nest of these people from the Vatican and the entourage are very safe under Romeo Tumo in San Paulo, Brazil, and the searching for the money has gone to various places in Bahama, Nicaragua, Peru, and the money is being put together to find out how so many millions were gone. 1.2 billion was missing, and that's a lot of hundred millions. And now they're nearing the end of trying the Calvi Trail. One of the people that worked with Roberta Calvi, of course, and Lysio Jelly, who's still alive, who's still in Peru, causing all the violence that is uh, bombing the airplanes, bombing the trains, rather, and uh, creating the excuse for a police state. They almost had a coup last week. The man who's arranging all that is Stefano Della Calle, who worked with Klaus Barbie in Bolivia until Bobby was arrested, then went on to um, uh, Peru, and he acted as the regulator for the P2 
and the Masonic Lodge with links to the Vatican and American Latin American dictatorships. And Delacay has been in the United States and not been arrested. He dips in and out of the United States. And I'll do a little more on him before the program is over. But he has those links, and he is allowed by our customs and people in the United States to travel here and out. And he's been charged with a part in the Bologna bombing, of which Francesco Pazienza can't be charged. The Americans say you can't blame him for that. And Delacay is out loose in Peru, causing literally the overthrow of that government to make it safe for particular fascism or drug dealers. There was a story in just in the Houston Post, July 13th. The mood in Europe, Monaco's concern over international terrorism focuses on shortage of American tourists. Now that is the most hypocritical, again, the most BS stuff is coming out in the newspapers. I'm sure the American tourists don't go there. I'm sure the American tourists are afraid of terrorism. But it was the P2 Lodge, the Masonic Lodge, a member of that lodge was Henry Kissinger, Roy Cohn was involved with that lodge. This was the Lysio Jelly Lodge. This was the Monte Carlo Lodge that decided on the Bologna bombing, the orders of Bologna bombing. The work with Klaus Barbie in Bolivia and with the military dictatorships and drug dealers around the world. Can't these people who cry about the lack of traffic make any connections to the reason people don't go there? It's written by Lynn Ashby, and if you were a little more careful to read the newspapers about the Monte Carlo origins of the the strategy of terror to get people afraid and to bring in fascism, one of the home bases was in Monte Carlo, and the effect of this strategy of tension, that's what it's called, Uh, Otto Skorzeny set it up, Hitler's most dangerous man went to work for um, he was kept under the nose of Henry Kissinger after the war. He went to work for the CIA. He worked for a Fritz Kramer in Germany, right under the orders of Fritz Kramer. That's why I want to know if it's the same one. He devised, along with uh, Stefano Delacaye, the strategy of tension, of bombing, of disarming people, not necessarily politically active, of scaring them. And Otto Skorzeny worked with the CIA and I wrote about him in my Rebel article on the Nazi connections to the Kennedy murder, and Skarzeny and Stefano uh, were instrumental in the opinions such as at the Monte Carlo Lodge. So if they want to uh, get their tourists back, they better get their head together about the origins of tension and what is happening today, the same problems that uh, have continued ever since these people got their heads together after World War II to keep people off guard by bombing and killing and uh, dope dealing and doing all kinds of crimes that could always have been figured out and they could always have been arrested except that our intelligence community and our defense community went along with various countries in promoting this as a means of asking for more police for the eventual police state. And there's a story this morning in the paper I'm sure you enjoyed seeing. Helms Aid, this is Jesse Helms, Helms aide reportedly gave information for a fee. This is August the 11th, 1986, San Francisco Chronicle. A chief aide to Senator Jesse Helms, the Republican from North Carolina, maintained a business near the senator's Washington office. He sold information on taxes, on foreign affairs, and other subjects to North Carolina corporate executives. Now, beyond that, where did they go? And they described... The uh, two businessmen told the Charlotte Observer they paid $20,000 a year, these corporate people, to the aid of Jesse Helms, who had a business on the side. Now, the aide's name is James Lucier. If you add an F between it, it would be James Lucifer. We can call him James Lucifer, the senator's chief investigative aide. Senate rules do not prohibit staff members from operating businesses outside where they sell information on what the senator knows, he ran the business from 1972 when Jesse Helms was elected until 1981. From then on, once Reagan was in, they could get all their information free. And Jesse Helms is on the Foreign Relations Committee, so they don't have to pay. Uh, they were paid $20,000 um, uh, a year by these particular corporate executives. And then they, of course, have no promise to keep it under their heads. Excuses for business purposes. 
but how do we know it was all business? The article says neither Helms nor Lucifer could be reached for comment. Former Senator Robert Morgan, Democrat of New North Carolina, who was a member of the Senate Ethics Committee, said selling information gained through your position as a government official would be improper. Morgan was defeated by the 1980 election by John East, who just allegedly committed suicide several weeks ago and is now blaming Bethesda Hospital for his death, tantamount to a murder, and I'll update that for you later. And they cited two people who were customers and from 1972, when he was elected to 1981, and these are the years of Spiragnu and Richard Nixon and Mr. Rehnquist as advisor to the Justice Department and Robert Martin at the time. These activities came when uh, when Jesse Helms was sent to Congress in Washington. Then his top aide uh, opens up his own advisory service, his own private business where he sells information. It was called Capital Information Services, which is what it was. It came right out of the Capitol. It came right out of Jesse Helms, uh, a long friend of Roberta Dobison, and the police state mechanics. This information then went out to clients. His chief aide sold it. Uh, there was a long article. There's been many, many articles in Executive Intelligence Review, which many of you freak out if I mention it. I'll just cite one that was published June 27th. Mexico hits Helms outrage. Fires Wall Street darling. Senator Jesse Helms has called for a stop to all economic aid to Mexico until the Mexican government agrees to turn over power to the Nazi party. In public hearings on June 17th, sponsored by a subcommittee on Western Hemisphere Affairs, Helms said that Mexico deserves no help from the international community until its electoral process is opened up. He presented what he called secret statistics on the 1982 presidential election that showed the Nazi opposition gaining over 55% of the national vote. That's the Pan Party. He questioned the legitimacy of the Mexican president, and at his hearings, he had a series of attacks against Mexico. In this article, is, it goes on to describe black propaganda and says one must ask Helms or his staff, who apparently got the documents, how does he explain that the president of, of Mexico, Mr. De La Madrid, for three years has been president, and not one single person in or out of Mexico challenged his legitimacy. Not even the Pan Party, which is the fascist party, nor the Communist Party, the PSUM, went so far as Jesse Helms. Jesse Helms is lying and creating problems for Mexico. Now, another article, which is quite lengthy and in great detail, I'm going to share with you, uh, usually excerpt, excerpt a lot of articles, uh, and read the highlights, but this is very important, and it's June 27, 1986. Politics makes strange bedfellows. Politicians and some members of the intelligence community in Washington are trying to figure out how highly classified material from April 21st and May 8th, the closed-door hearings on Panama held by Senator Jesse Helms ended up in the New York Times piece by Seymour Hirsch. Helms purports to be so hard right, he was last witness trying to democratize Panama by putting a hardcore Nazi, Arnulfo Arias, in power. The documents show that from the United States archives that Arias met with SS, that's the uh, Gestapo SS, head Heinrich Himmler. They opened meetings with a Nazi salute at Heil Hitler. He was under investigation for drug running and he sought to drive the United States military from Panama. This is the man that Jesse Helms wants as the president of Panama. Helms appeared to back off on Panama until Seymour Hirsch of the New York Times published an article to torpedo Arias's opponent, General Noriega, the head of Panama Defense Forces. Hirsch is a perfect shill for the Jesse Helms plan to, in quotes, democratize, democratize Panama by installing the lackey of Adolf Hitler. After serving as press secretary to Senator Eugene McCarthy, 1968 presidential campaign, Seymour Hirsch joined members of the Institute for Policy Studies in founding a fund for investigative journalism. Now, Gene McCarthy is described in the book Who's Who in the CIA with the CIA backgrounds, and I understand Seymour Hirsch is coming out with a book on the Korean airline which absolutely whitewashes the American involvement in the complicated conspiracy 
in the Larry McDonald sector I've talked to him personally about, which he completely threw out. And Seymour Hirsch was adamant in saying the CIA had no role in killing Salvador Allende in Chile. And later it turned out they very, had a very good role and he knew it all along and the ev evidence was available all along. The article goes on that Seymour Hirsch did a study of chemical and biological weapons, which I'm anxious to get a hold of, which cited confessions of tortured POW in Korea to claim General Douglas MacArthur employed biological weapons in the Korean War. And this article goes on to say that because of the article on chemical and biological weapons, he forced Richard Nixon to put a ban on them in 1971. And the ban in 71 is when he turned the laboratories over to Lytton Industry, which is military, and they could continue the biological weapons under different names and different organizations. The article continues, the journalist associates of Hirsch report he made a deal with director of CIA William Colby, this is during the Watergate years, in CIA director Colby, who leaked Hirsch the CIA family jewels gathered by Colby when he's deputy to Daniel Ellsberg's protege, director of CIA James Schlesinger. Hirsch claims, himself claims Colby fired the head of the CIA counterintelligence after Colby met with Seymour Hersh to preempt a damaging New York Times article. Intelligence sources wonder whether Colby's associates recently helped search Simon Hirsch, Seymour Hersh do a hatchet job on Panama's Noriega. It bears the same paw prints as the innuendo and slander that has continued against Noriega to put the Nazi, the Arias, Anulfo Arias, into power. The Seymour Hirsch not only claims Noriega worked as a double agent for U.S. intelligence against Cuba, but that U.S. could read what Noriega reported to the Cubans, a leak that, if it was true, could put the general's life in danger. Almost the same charges against Noriega appeared later in a Washington newspaper, this is the Washington Times, a Reverend Moon paper, by Georgie Ann Geyer. She claimed that these papers had been discussed with Senator Jesse Helms at closed-door hearings, that Jesse Helms had these papers, and evidently Seymour Hersh received them to blast Noriega and link him to drugs to Cuba and so forth, and Panama to Nicaragua and the drug dealing. The sources report that the article was actually written by Jesse Helms' aide, Deborah DeMoss, the superior in Helms' office, and by Jim Lucier, that Jim Lucifer, the same man who had the public relations firm that was selling from 1971 to 1982 information that Jesse Helms had to privately get out of the congressional offices. And the person working on the Noriega story and the drug dealing to put a member of the SS, a not a member of the SS, but sympathetic to the SS and Himmler and Hitler into power in Panama. The article says a member of Geyer's staff disclosed she had talked with DeMoss about the hearings that were taking place. Is DeMoss one of the leaks of the Seymour Hersh story of the highly classified material? It wouldn't be the first time that DeMoss, the aide of Jesse Helms, who works with Mr. Jim Lucifer, could let security out the window. And this continues, look in the bed. One adage when investigating leaks is don't look under the bed, look in it. A government official, a leading journalist, and a noted author all claim that Deborah DeMoss had a torrid affair with Colonel Roberta Dobison, the El Salvador right-winger who tried unsuccessfully for the presidency. Helm's staff picked up Dobison at a 1980 meeting of the World Anti-Communist League, also attended by Bologna, the train station bomber and hired assassin of the Bolivian cocaine colonels, Stefano de la Calle. Now that's the guy who's in Peru who headed the death squad, squads, who's part of the B2, P2, the Vatican connections. Stefano de la Calle at a meeting of the World Anti-Communist League with Jesse Helms and the sweetheart of Dobison, uh, the lover of Dobison, Deborah de Moss, is the top aide with Jesse Helms along with Jim Lucifer, the man who was selling and he may be giving them away now and stopped in 1981 selling them. And they were with Stefano Delacaye. DeMoss was assigned to chaperone Dobison around Washington when he came and visited him frequently in San Salvador. Je Senator Helms was on such intimate terms with Dobison 
that his staff allegedly planned a fabricated story about the CIA funding Dobison's moderate opponent in El Salvador elections to make it appear that the man he was running against worked with American intelligence. This phony story triggered a plot which may have been linked to Dobison to murder U.S. Ambassador to El Salvador Thomas Pickering. And in comes Vernon Walters, a knight of Malta, who allegedly was the one to stop the plot when the plot story was created by Dobison to link the, his opponent to the Central Intelligence Agency. Deborah Moss would not return calls, this article says, uh, involving the pattern of leaks from the Helms, Strange Bedfellows with Seymour Hirsch. And at the time that story broke, I said it was a big diversionary of Noriega to link him to Fidel Castro in Nicaragua that I'm sure none of them are angels. And there's lots of drugs in Panama. And there's a lot of dummy fronts of the Vatican in Panama. And Jim Jones had lots of millions in Panama. They're not clean. But the gist of this article is that Miss DeMoss was leaking to her alleged lover intelligence on a plot to kill the United States ambassador. And she said, I did it on orders from President Reagan, relayed by Senator Helms. The White House has not returned calls, but she blamed uh, President Reagan for these shenanigans. So we get a cycle of these people surfacing now in the news, bits and pieces of their interconnections and the interplay. And the bottom line, of course, of all of this is drugs and weapons and assassination teams. My time is up now, and I'll continue. I want to get back to the Sikhs and their role in Ecuador, what they're doing there. I l left off last week. I didn't update it. I'll do more next week, along with a lot of more of the scandalous news. In the meantime, this is May Brussel. Thank you for your letters, articles, books that I've been getting. And as I said last week, I will start writing and answering my mail very soon.